This is Bold Dominion, a state politics explainer for Changing Virginia. I'm Nathan Moore. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, According to former President Ronald Reagan, those are the nine most terrifying words in the English language. You know, honestly, I always kind of hated that quote. To me, government is the peaceful means through which we figure out how to have a society and take care of our people. But that said, government is also messy, and it often fails to live up to its promises. Regardless, Reagan's maxim has undoubtedly been influential. In the 1980s, he ushered in a rightward turn in the Republican Party that still echoes today. And today's distrust of government institutions is more widespread than just Republicans. That's especially true for the legislative branch. At the federal level, Congress's approval rating has hovered around just 20% for years. And truth be told, in our lifetimes, it seems like lawmakers have stopped being able to get things done at the federal level and even at the state level here in Virginia. I started this podcast three years ago in part because I was frustrated at how the media covered the Virginia General Assembly. It seemed like every year around this time, there was a veritable parade of stories about bills being introduced, and then they'd quietly die in committee. Or a bill that would pass in one chamber, and then quietly die in the other chamber. It seemed like hardly anything ever translated into meaningful laws that changed Virginia for the better. Why were things like that? Well, now in Virginia, that did change some in 2020. That's when Democrats gained control of the state Senate, the House of Delegates, and the governorship. And what followed were two years of substantial new laws. Major criminal justice reform, bills about climate change and renewable energy, a hike in the minimum wage, cannabis legalization, and lots more. Well, we're talking with two guests on Bold Dominion today, and both of them explained that that short time period turned out to be the exception that proved the rule. This year, with a Democratic majority state Senate and Republicans controlling the House and Governor's Mansion, we're likely to see a lot fewer bills actually make it into law. But that won't stop legislators from trying. They all want to hit the campaign trail with issues they can talk about. And so the last thing they want is actual policy change on any of that stuff because they want to hit the campaign trail and, you know, win their election, and win their primary, and win the general. That's Michael Pope. He's a journalist, friend of the show, and head of the Virginia Capital Correspondents Association. Michael has his boots on the ground, reporting from the Capitol right now. In the second half of the show, he gives us an inside look at the current General Assembly session. And he also pushes back, graciously I might add, on the media criticisms I just levied about the way the media covers these legislative stories that often go nowhere. But first, we turn to another Richmond-based journalist, Peter Galaska. He spoke with Bold Dominion producer Arian Balu about some of the structural and historical reasons that the General Assembly may not be as effective as we like it to be. Well, I think what you're seeing is what's what could be loosely called the Virginia way, where nothing gets done in the General Assembly. Everything is watered down for the most part. And I think what really comes to mind is a book written in 1977 by Garrett Epps. And he was a, from an old Richmond family. And he wrote about how uh, it's called the shad treatment. And what that means is that um, every spring when the shad run, the fish run in the creeks and rivers, that they had a big political event down near Suffolk where they'd plank sad and they put t- tap the tail of the shed fish onto a, a wooden plank and slowly uh, roast it by a wood fire. But by the time everything was done, there's no shed left. And that's sort of what happens to legislation in the Virginia and it's traditional. Is that is that sort of unusual? You know, to what extent is this a bug? Is it a feature? Is it a good or a bad thing? What do you think? Well, there's several things you've got to realize about Virginia is that there's a sort of overwhelming attitude that over overshadows everything that the powers that be for, you know, a couple centuries now really don't want the public too involved in anything. And so um, because it was sort of an old planner uh, society and they just, you know, just didn't want anybody involved because they ruled it because they owned the land. And I think what's going on now, the the two big problems or several big problems with the General Assembly is one, it's part time. You don't have professional staffs. And in in this case, it's a very short, short, you know, period of time. It's, you know, scheduled for 30 days. And that's crazy when you've got hundreds of bills to consider 
and you only have a month to do it in. And this is just the way it's rigged. Also, one last factor is there's election there later this year. Nobody wants to stick their neck out too much. So you add it all up and nothing's going to get done. I mean, why bother? And um, and time and time again, that's why the committees have so much power in the General Assembly, because they're sort of the um, the gatekeepers under very great pressure. Uh, well, another angle of this is uh, sort of the, the the media side where, you know, you've you described a pretty good outline of why not much is going to happen. But we do still see during the session a bunch of stories come out about how the House, you know, passes this climate bill or this abortion bill or uh, something or another, and one side cheers, one the other side cheers, doesn't go anywhere in the end. So what is the, you know, what is the point, I guess, of, of the way that the, the media sort of handles uh, an assembly like this? Well, the problem is there's not much media left. And, um, you know, nobody really covers the General Assembly or other parts of government the way they used to. And when they used to cover it, it wasn't that good. I remember I worked for the Richmond Times Dispatch 40 some years ago, and I was kind of disappointed. That's when they were big and rich and had, you know, bureaus all over the place. And they overcovered stuff. And they would do what you call uh, a turn of the screw story, where, you know, instead of saying, hey, this is coming, this passed, et cetera, they do, they follow the bill or whatever, uh, you know, all the way up the scales. And there might be several of them at the same time, all pretty much saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so they, they, they would say, and they, they would give the readers the impression that things are really being done when they weren't. And um, I think a, a much better way to do it is say what needs to be done, what's being happening, what's happening, and what is the impact of going, you know, on real people, what's going to happen. And, and they don't do that. And even, and even that is still, even though there's a greatly diminished uh, media presence in the state, as there is in every state. You know, it's like they they still have this kind of old attitude that um, we got to know if it goes from this committee to this to the delegates or to the Senate or whatever. And, um, you know, if you're a lobbyist, um, I guess that's that's, of course, very important to you. But for the public, you know, the public needs to know the big picture and they're not really getting it. For, for somebody who kind of doesn't know what what it's like to be doing that as a as a journalist, you know, can you can you walk through what what is it what is it uh, um, you know covering the government while it's in session look like? Well, I mean, it used to be you know you have bills bills proposed, and then after several bills or whatever bills are proposed, you should go say and, and the delegates goes to the speaker um, of the house, who then you know forwards a particular bill to a particular committee, and that committee you know argues the merits of the bill. And if things go forward, it goes to a vote, a full vote in the House of Delegates. Same thing happens in the Senate. Then there's a crossover where, say, the House of Delegates, you know, approves something. The Senate has to as well. Then, of course, it goes to the governor to sign. But um, the issue is that puts, because of the pressure on the members of, of the General Assembly in short sessions, and they're not professionals, they don't have a staff, really, um, what that means is it gives the committees on both both houses or both sides of the General Assembly a hell of a lot of power. And a lot of that stuff is done behind closed doors without anybody knowing what's really being said. And that's what really happens. So I guess, you know, uh, uh, we, we talk about the fact that not much is, is going to happen, you know, in this session. What do you think is the kind of doubt, like the, the reaction to that? Is that popular? Is that liked? Is it not liked? You know, what do uh, what do people feel about it? I guess. Well, I think if people who are really advocates and are passionate about a particular issue, um, these could be like you know, anti-abortion, pro-abortion, could be things like environmentalists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, the lobbyists who are most concerned about regulation and keeping their costs down for their you know, corporate clients, um, they follow this stuff really a lot, but the general public does not. And um, I've always been kind of surprised in many ways. I've always just been a, I worked in Virginia, but I've also worked in a number of states as a journalist, including, you know, DC, New York, Chicago, Ohio, places like that. And I've always been amazed at how much, you know, 
the, the, the governor and the General Assembly means in Virginia. And part of that goes to some obs obscure kind of law or thing called the Dillon Rule. And Dillon was, I think he was in Iowa back at the turn of the 19th century. And he came up with the idea that localities can only have as much power as their state legislature gives them. And Virginia at, follows this rule. I don't know why. I've always been puzzled why they bother. But that means that it really puts all the power back into the state legislature and the governor. And um, so otherwise, a lot of people who are passionate advocates for a particular cause or policy are stuck with the General Assembly which, as we've discussed, is a short-term, you know, kind of non-professional body. It, it seems like there is kind of an, an, an imbalance between sort of the, when you've got divided government, we've got uh, two parties sort of squaring off. It seems like that tends to fit, would I be right in saying that kind of tends to favor uh, the GOP, the Republicans? There's a sense in which at least, like, that sort of is, what part of that coalition is sort of those who, specifically don't want to see anything get done or don't want to or want a government to get as little done as possible. Is that sort of a, a fair assessment of it or, or what do you think? Well, it, it depends. I mean, you look at the, a couple of years ago when the Democrats held both houses. Um, I mean, you got a lot done. You had the Virginia Clean Economy Act. You had the regional greenhouse gas initiative on the, on the green side of the spectrum. And it was like the most sweeping environmental reform in the state ever. And now that things have turned turtles of sort of giving the Republicans more power, they're doing everything they can to get rid of that. And, um, you know, and the other thing too is that, you know, cultural wars, culture wars have really been kicked in the last, uh, you know, fueled by Donald Trump and a lot of other things. Um, things such as what to read in schools. And uh, that's a huge conten contentious issue. And um, there's more power on the right these days for some reason. What do you kind of see as the stuff that, you know, can get done, can get passed? Where do you think there is uh, some of this, you know, bipartisan energy that can still, you know, get some things done? There have been some some positive uh, bipartisan developments where you know, everybody agrees on the same idea and goes forward. Um, and that can happen. The problem is, though, is that, you know, right now it's divided and you're not going to do that. At the same time, it's going to be difficult um, because of elections, because both parties are going to posture to their uh, electoral base. And they've got to appear to be you know, like abortion, for example. I mean, abortion changes have been bogged down in committee. Nothing's going to happen. I mean, Youngkin and the Republicans want to uh, be further restrictive and shortening the time. Uh, allowed uh, for abortions to 15 weeks or therefore. So there are a bunch of bills around to do that, but nothing's going to happen there. And um, and I mean, neither side is going to, I mean, the Democrats don't want to look like they're um, anti-abortion. And of course, in the more conservative areas, um, you know, uh, politicians want to show that they're tough on abortions, but it's it's the difference between posturing and actually doing is, is really pretty big. Is there anything else on this that I've kind of missed or, or some some part of this topic that feels like we need to uh, get into? No, it's just it's, it's, it's not it's not a very pretty sight this time. And I, I you know, what really needs to happen is, is Virginia, in my opinion, needs a complete revamp of how they have, handle the legislature. And I think they should probably go for longer terms or, you know, fun professional you know, legislatures with real professional staffs. Have you ever seen what the the pay scale of a you know senator or a delegate is it's like in the twenty to twenty thousand dollars a year roughly, uh -huh. and that's year round, and and then there, that includes like you know a month or six weeks or whatever, two months of staying you know in session, and it's this uh, el cheapo mentality that the state has, where they pay people nothing, work them to death, don't provide enough support services, and then they um, wonder why nothing gets done. I mean. <laughs> That's sort of in the hands of the legislature, isn't it? Um, why don't they make that change? Well, because I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, it's like so much. It's like, you know, it's sort of a glacier moving. It's very slow. It's massive. It doesn't take, you know, it goes on and on. But um, 
you know, this would require a great deal of, of citizen concern. The media would have to be attentive to it. But this is the way it's always been done. And, you know, it's hard to change anything in this day. Peter Galaska is a journalist based in the Richmond area. You're listening to Bold Dominion, a state politics explainer for Changing Virginia. Visit us online at bolddominion.org. Hey, and I want to tell you, we're looking for good ideas to cover in future episodes. If you've ever had a question about state politics, just something that doesn't make sense and you want somebody to explain it to you, let us know. Maybe we can help. You can also suggest guest ideas. We talk to people across the political spectrum as long as they are good at explaining why things are the way they are. Shoot us an email at bolddominion at virginia.edu. And you can always find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are served up. Go ahead and subscribe. And hey, leave us a nice review while you're there. Bold Dominion is a member of Virginia Audio Collective, online at virginiaaudio.org. You can check out all the podcasts from the collective, from science explainers to Virginia history to the future of democracy. We amplify the voices of people in our commonwealth and help them tell stories that matter. You can listen and subscribe at virginiaaudio.org. And we're back. In the second half of today's show, Bold Dominion producer Arian Balu talks with Michael Pope. He's a journalist who covers the General Assembly, and he's head of the Virginia Capital Correspondents Association, which means he's down in Richmond right now, reporting on bills as they rise and fall. To start things off, he dives a little more into the reason for this year's political gridlock. Well, this is an era of divided government. So we've got a Republican as governor, we've got a Republican House of Delegates, but we've got Democrats leading the state Senate. So anytime you talk about any of the culture war issues, abortion or gun rights, you're going to come down to a, a, a situation where both sides want to go into the campaign cycle talking about it rather than actually doing something with the policy. So um, a lot of heat and drama, not a lot of action in terms of actual policy changes, but they're setting the stage to go on the campaign trail here in 2023. Many of these people have got very competitive primaries, um, and a lot of them actually have very competitive uh, general elections because we've got all these new maps. So this is a campaign cycle that is you know, one like any other. And so all of these lawmakers are up for re-election, re all 100 members of the House, all 40 members of the Senate. So they all want to hit the campaign trail with issues they can talk about, abortion and guns. And so the last thing they want is actual policy change on any of that stuff because they want to hit the campaign trail and you know win their election and win their primary and win the general. And so uh, you're not really going to see a lot of actual policy changes this general assembly session. But there are some areas where they actually might make some very important decisions. Mental health is one of them. So uh, Virginia is fortunate to have a budget situation that is flush with cash because of all the stuff that they've been getting from the federal government in terms of stimulus funding. And so they want to pump some of that into going, you know, uh, taking the first steps in solving this mental health crisis. So, um, you know, mobile crisis support people, mobile units, uh, in investments for facilities that can handle um, these kinds of situations so that they don't get involved in the criminal justice system. And so, you know, mental health reform is actually on the horizon for this General Assembly session. In addition to that, another important decision on casinos. So Petersburg wants to have a referendum to allow a casino, and that actually could happen this General Assembly session. So um, we are in an era of divided government, and so anytime you're talking about the culture wars, you're really not going to see a lot of action there. But on mental health and a host of other issues, casinos, in, in addition to energy regulation, um, there is actual stuff that's being debated this year. You know, you're a, you're a journalist. You're head of the Virginia Capital Correspondents Association for at least a few more days now. We get a lot of stories about, you know, this bill is brought up in the House, this bill is brought up in the Senate, um, you know, X and Y and Z. And we get those stories, and they come out, and then they get killed by the House, by the Senate, by the governor. What is going on there? So I recognize that one of the concerns that many people have 
about coverage of the General Assembly is that it is often so incremental. Here's this one thing that happened on this one day, this one committee with this one bill. And then you say, I don't really know the scope of this. I don't understand the context. And um, I know that one of the people who has that opinion is the host of Bold Dominion, who in fact started the podcast as a reaction to that kind of journalism, which is understandable. And Nathan Moore is right that sometimes when you just look at a very small sliver of things, you lack the context and you don't understand the full breadth of what we're talking about. And I'll give you a really good example of this is every year, There is a bill to limit campaign finance, right? So um, right now, Virginia is the Wild West. You can donate any amount of money. There's no limit on how much money you can give. And so every year there is some kind of discussion about, well, maybe we should have a cap. So um, and then they kill the bill. So it's an incremental story. If you say, here's this bill everybody knew was going nowhere. But here's the senator who stood up and said, well, maybe it's a bad idea to have an unlimited amount of money that you can throw at the political system. And that bill is killed. Well, that is an incremental story, right? I mean, like, it's not explaining to you how our government works. Uh, It's revealing to you a little bit about how our government works in the sense that the idea that you might actually put a cap on the amount of money that you could donate to a political candidate in Virginia is so out of the mainstream that they don't even really talk about it or give it much discussion. Um, so uh, it, it it's Nathan Moore is right that it that's an incremental story that you say, um, here's this one senator who thought it was a good idea to put some caps on it and the bill was killed. However, I would counter that by saying that's an important story. Um, that incremental story actually is revealing in terms of how our government works and what the people in charge believe about how the world works and how money uh, is involved with the political system. I want to turn our attention a little bit um, to kind of the sort of history of, of all of this. I mean, this is not the first time, certainly in, in Virginia's history, that we've had uh, a government that is divided between parties. Um, and yet, it it kind of seems like uh, um like there's almost no hope for anything getting done this session is that sort of unusual is that how things have have gone in the state in the past what is the what's the sort of context there i think the popular wisdom would tell you that voters want divided government because they do do not want their government to be doing a lot of things and so if you have divided government they're not going to meddle in the industry that you work in They're not going to meddle in your home life. They're not going to tell you that you should do this or that or the other thing. And um, that sort of divided government is a recipe for the government kind of staying out of your life and not meddling with you. Um, I will say in my own personal experience, the one, so divided government is the norm. That's actually how things normally happen. Um, There was a time period when We did not have divided government and the Democrats were in charge of everything. And gosh, they did a lot of stuff in that time period. So that was really only two, two years that they've got, they had the, you know, the governors, the executive mansion and the Lieutenant governor and the attorney general and the house of delegates and the state Senate. So they had the whole, you know, triumvirate of state government and they changed how voting happens. They secured abortion rights. They implemented a whole huge amount of gun violence restriction measures, and they did massive environmental regulation that changed the face of fossil fuels in Virginia to encourage wind power and solar power. And in that really short, very brief two-year period where we did not have divided government, wow, we had an activist government. I mean, like, I, you look back on it now and you think about it as kind of a Virginia version of the New Deal um, for 2020 when the Democrats took power because they did a lot of stuff that is currently the law in Virginia, right? So um, that's the aberration is non-divided government um, when all that stuff happened. Usually what happens is it's divided government and people introduce a lot of crazy stuff and it dies. None. If if divided government is sort of the uh, the standard fare, uh, what does get done? 
or what has got what has gotten done in the past? Well, keep in mind, there's a lot of procedural stuff that needs to happen. So the county governments will come to the state government and say, hey, look, you really need to change this oversight of our departments because we need federal money and we can't get the federal money unless we can prove that this department had an auditor. So you need to make sure you hire an auditor for this department so that we can get federal resources for this and that. And so they're like, okay, yeah, unanimous approval. Let's do that. So it's, there are actually are, there's a lot of stuff that happens that uh, just sort of flies by and is incremental um, and important that actually does happen. And keep in mind, all the judges are elected by the General Assembly. So in a lot of states, uh, voters choose judges, but here in Virginia, the General Assembly elects judges. And so they spend a lot of time, you know, interviewing the judges. And sometimes there's a lot of debate about who is going to become a judge. And so uh, it's divided government and all the culture war issues. We're not going to see a lot of action, but you know, they are going to elect some judges and they are going to enact some procedural things that will help local governments balance their books. And so, I mean, you know, there, there is actual stuff that's happening here in Richmond. Michael Pope is a journalist who covers the General Assembly. You can hear more of his coverage on his podcast, Pod Virginia. And if you're interested in the history of Virginia politics, which I assume you are, you should also check out his latest book. It's called The Bird Machine in Virginia and it explains the history of Virginia's machine politics and the consolidation of power into just a few executive roles. Well, my name's Nathan Moore, and I'm the host of Bold Dominion. Our producer and editor this week was Arian Balu. You can find us online at bolddominion.org. And don't forget to subscribe. It's just a click away.